Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Errahmanirrahim. Maliki yevmiddin. İyyâke na'budu ve iyyâke nasta'in. İhidne sirâd el-mustaqîn. Sirâd el-lezzîne an'amta aleyhim. Gayri al-ba'dûl ve aleyhim ve la'dâllîn. Amin. İnnâ fatahnâ laka fatahn mubinan. Lihafirâ laka ve ta'akadama min zanbika ve ma ta'akhar. Ve yutimma ni'matahu aleyka ve yahdiyaka sirâtan mustaqîman. Ve yansuka Allah'un nasran azizan. هو الذي أنزل السكينة في قلوب المؤمنين ليزدادوا إيمانا مع إيمانه ولله جنود السماوات والأرض وكان الله عليما حكيما بحرمة الله مفصل وسلم وبارك على هذا النبي الكريم سيد سند الأزيم زل قلب الرحيم سيدنا محمد ولا عليه وصحبه وسلم تسليما ربنا عطينا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقينا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين آمين آمين شكرا إمام جل بشاب يا دفلو بليز Good chairman Lord God of power and might the creator sustainer and preserver of all human being that you have created and planted in every nation of the world. We continue to ask that you look kindly upon each and every one of us. Forgive our human imperfections, our human frailty, our human weakness, our human sinfulness, and all the evil things that we do as human beings towards one another and against you. We pray that by your Holy Spirit's power that you will grant each and every one of us the grace to exercise humility, meekness, patience, respect for one another, and the rule of law. As we continue the TRRC sitting this morning, we continue to pray that you shall grant the witness to be bold enough to speak the truth. Grant the commission, the designing spirit to design between truth and falsehood. And we continue to pray for uh, the populace, the diaspora, and the international community at large, that you grant each and every one of them the equal <laughs> dose of extra patience to allow the due process to take its proper course. And at the end of the day, you shall reward each and every one accordingly. This we ask to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop Bodiko. Council, if we are ready with this morning's witness, you may please proceed. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, and members of the audience. Uh, we are ready to proceed with uh, the witness from yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Mbai. Welcome back to the TRRC. Mr. Mbai, you are the TRRC. May I remind you that you are still on the earth? Uh, I would also remind you that uh, it is a violation of the laws of this country to provide false or misleading information. Uh, uh, such information given to a truth commission as this one or to be made to have been made on the oath. 
lo xamne joxe nga ko fi ci commission bi wala bo nga def ko jamono jo xamne waat nga be pare uh, may i remind you of the protocols also that uh, uh, you speak after the interpretation ma fateli la be legi tamit ne bala nga tontu da nga xaar beñ la patol dacce bi be pare and uh, that we should both avoid uh, overlapping speeches ñun ñep na ku ci nek moy tondiku suñ cadeau yi tek la ndo before we close for the day yesterday we were talking about the decrees that were passed by the AFPRC junta during your tenure as attorney general di mbabala ñoon wacc nak ñu do waxtane mbir yi loi yi nga xamne soldat AFPRC taxawalon nañ ko te jamono joju yow ya nekkon attorney general and the purpose of this inquiry is to show the violation of rights that were inherent that were inbuilt uh, in these uh, in these decrees legi ne li nga xamne mom lañ ci setlu moy fan yi nga xamne yaxa nañ ci yele fi dom adam ci bir loi yu non i now refer to decree number 11 legi nak ñu dem ci fan na bo ñu wax decree number 11 Uh, this is the public assets and properties recovery decree lo nam mo ngi aju ci nga xamne non la ño jotaté ci li nga xamne modi alel yi ak momé fi nit ñi otherwise known as the akoto bamfo commission ñu xamé ko ci commission bi nga xamne akoto bamfo moko jité won and mr mbay i hope you have looked at this decrees uh, but the decrees targeted individuals who were living above above uh the pay grade uh da fa melni dikri yoyu nak da fa am ño xamne dal ñom lañ ci doon natta ñom lañ doon setlu seen mbir tax ñu duggal ko ci bir dikri bi and all it was looking for is whether they maintained a standard of living above which was commensurate uh with their past official emoluments yep liñ doon set nak moy li nga xamne mo di sen am am tollu way bi fa nga xamne mom la tollu buñ ko mengali ak balañ leen doon jox place bo are you familiar with that mr mr may i am looking at specifically um section 2 uh b1 of uh, of of of of of of the decree it's it states the terms of reference of the commissions are and then point b to inquire and investigate into the activities of all persons referred to in paragraph that and that and that uh what number what number is it the uh, number 11 of 1994 yes sir and uh, it was dated um 10 november 1994 Uh, and it targeted uh, basically most senior officers in police military uh, local government managing directors uh, top civil servants and uh, ambassadors and ministers and what it was looking for is whether they maintained a standard of living above that which was commensurate with the past official emoluments that is too sweeping mr mbay isn't it too too sweeping it was a good decree a uh, degree bu bax la won de then so accountability eh uh, pour gis nak ne da nañ doxal ñep people are found to live beyond their means uh, but, but, but mr the, mbay is that is that a violation of laws to live beyond one's means but no in fact this is not living beyond one's means it's be living beyond one's official emoluments lolu nax da fa melni xana lolu dañ ko mëna oyé né yaxa loi la bu féké né nit ki nga xamné non la dundé ci walé am amam wéssu nako even in the civilian government ya ci nguri civilian yi it was never followed a topu ñon ko it was provided in letters when ministers are being appointed ndax dañ ko top son ci ay letter ci anami nga xamni ni ministre yi ñu ngi leen ay ñu ngi leen falé to declare their assets et pour nak ñu yébané nak li nga xamni ni mom lañ am ci alal this degree ci degree bi nak was in the same spirit momit ci ben taxaway bi rek la mr mbay the intention may have been that yes mr mbay djublu way bi nak mën na doon lolu but what is captured in the decree is completely different li nga xamne nak mom lañ woné ci bir decree bi nak dafa uté 
Uh, what you describe is like opening a window. This is opening doors, yeah, several yeah. doors into the house. Yeah, linga wana rek mo ubi bere bunda rek wali limo nuru mo ya fa ubi ai bunta ichi bari. Because a lot of people may have lived beyond their official emoluments, but true income that was legitimately earned. And this decree does not seem to provide for any exception for those things. It does not create for any defense of legitimately earned property. Yeah. Just says you live above your means, above your official emoluments, you are captured, you are caught. Yeah. Whereas, whereas others may have property, that they earn more income. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. I'm glad when you said that might have been, that was the intention of the decree. When interpreting any statute, we will agree. Yeah. That it is right that we look for the intention of the legislature, in this case, maybe the council. But I'm not, I'm not quarreling with your assessment of it. Okay. Right. But, and and uh, even if we look at the application, yeah. this was the decree that was most complained about mm -hmm. uh, by, by the people who were affected at the time, especially in terms of the egregious violations of rights that were meted out on those people. People were unceremoniously booted out of their homes. Yes. Uh, their jewelry, possessions, and things were confiscated. The application was wrong. When you say that the decree is not the same, you have to take care of your family. You have to take care of your family. You have to take care of your family. You have to take care of your family. You have to take care of your family. And there is no louder or more eloquent testimony of that than my own life, my own experience. Have you been, have you been evicted, evicted from my property for nine years? But as I indicated to you earlier when you met me in the room, as Attorney General, at the time, I cannot deny the nature and extent uh, of this decree the violation and abuse of human rights. Uh, but I sought to say that if I am allowed to give a statement uh, that will explain the context of this decree and that would help us that will Shorten the proceedings on, on these decrees. And will, and will help us to come to a very amicable agreement on my responsibility. Not for the enactment of these decrees. But as Attorney General at the time, I can be free from the results, the consequences. Because I myself was a victim of these decrees. So will I be allowed to make this statement? Yeah. Yes, very well, Mr. Mbai. But uh, uh, let's do it step by step. Okay. Uh, you are entitled to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, and the circumstances uh, surrounding the making of these degrees, and, and, and to show, say whatever you believe you need to say Good. in your own interest. Uh, but in the meantime, we, we need to know why, are, why were these decrees very bad law? And we also want to show why was it so obvious all lawyers that these were bad laws, not just at the implementation stage, but at the drafting stage. Because the moment you look at it, the few things as you one should look at as a lawyer is what are the safeguards against abuse that are inbuilt 
in these laws, considering already that the Constitution, which is the safe haven of the people for the protection of their rights, has been tossed out. Now everybody was left vulnerable at the mercy of young boys, most of them with very little experience, and with awesome power and the barrel of the gun. That is why it was so important to all of us that, in fact, there were people like yourself, Uncle Fafa, who would look at these things and say, hang on, wait a minute. Where are the protections for the people? Mm -hmm. And if you look at Decree 11, there are no inbuilt protections. All the powers were just given to the commission, period. There is no judicial oversight of the exercise of the powers of this commission. In fact, where it became apparent that there may be judicial oversight, the jurisdiction was ousted. And, and, and, and this is quite creative legislative drafting. Hmm. Let me buttress your point. Yes. When they took me to the, to the Algali Commission, <laughs> on the reassessment of my tax, I have already paid tax for the whole period. The reassessment from the day I started practice in 1980. <laughs> Until 1994. Be atum 1994. And came up with the ridiculous sum of $4 million in areas of tax. When we sought to challenge that after six months, six years, six years, six years, six years, six years, six years, the Commission of Inquiry cannot reassess any tax after six years. The Commission of Inquiry cannot reassess any tax They amended the decree. Give it a limitless time. So my challenge on law was written by the amendment of the decree. So I very much know what you are talking about. Yes, the, uh, and, and the, the point we are trying to make is as at the time you were Attorney General, mm -hmm. these problems ought to have been obvious. Mm -hmm. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. uh, we would later discuss how they negatively affected you. Yeah. And for us, we condemn the bad application of these degrees to other people just like we would condemn their bad application to you and those after you. In a sense, we condemn all rights violations. And, and that was my anthem. Yeah. Both in the council and in the cabinet. Fantastic. Uh, that but, was why I was called the human rights attorney general. Uh, uh, so as chairman Yaya Jame would say, Abu Dentin's defense lawyer. Well, chairman the lawyer Abu Dentin. And and even that time, to a lot of people, it looked like some people were deliberately targeted. A lot of these people appeared to have been targeted for abuse. Those names never came up in the meetings that I attended. Uh, in effect of the decrees affected them. Uh, to you uh, no names were ever to mentioned in the council meetings or cabinet that I attended. Uh, but to the target, of course, court, as you put it, they became in, in affected. Fact, in fact, some, the targeting was so blatant 
that it was legislative. The laws, some you would see, they broad brushes, all managing directors, all sectories of this, all sectories. But some of these decrees, they name specific individuals, Abu Denti, Badufai, Hussein uh, Njai. That is a terrible way of legislating. Yes. You can name offices, but not individuals. Yes. These were anti schedules. Yes. Uh, but the Attorney General was giving the power to amend these schedules. No. So, no. Uh, I would give you, I would take you to Decree 14. Decree 14. I don't have degree 14. Have uh, degree 14. I'll, I'll send it to you, yeah. sir. Uh, it's an amendment to the Public Assets and Properties Recovery Decree. Am I so far you have never been connected to the Ministry of Finance? No, no, no. Just a little If you look at Section 2, the power to determine who would be subjected to this was given to the Attorney General. Decree 14? Yes. It's an, it's an amending, amendment to, uh, to, to the parents or the principal decree on the public assets recovery, and it says that the power to amend is given to, to this, this schedule is given to the Attorney General. The power? The Attorney General may. By order published in the Gazette, I mean the schedule. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so it therefore means the Attorney General had the power to determine mm -hmm. who was to be subjected to this bad law. Yes. You agree, sir? Yes, yeah, it's in the, the decree. What? Well, right. degree. Council, is that the sole purpose of that, um, uh, that uh, decree? Yes. Amendment? Yes. Okay. Uh, it, is, uh, it says the AFPRC hereby decrees as follows. This decree may be cited as the Public Assets and Properties Recovery amend Amendment Decree 1994. And Section 2, the Public Assets and Properties Recovery Decree 1994 is amended by inserting immediately after Section 25 the following new section. And it says Amendment of Schedule. 25A, the Attorney General may by order published in the Gazette amend the schedule. And what's the date of um, the decree? Uh, 16 November 1994. Thank you. So and are, we, are we sure that it was not amended? The schedule? Yes. Uh, I, have not, uh, I, I have not seen uh, the amend, an amendment to it. Uh, during your time as no. Attorney General? No, and the order published in the Gazette. You know, I'm just not too sure. Are you sure that there was no order published in the Gazette? I, in the, in the I have not seen any. Yeah. Uh, and, and to be quite candid, I did not check that. Yeah. I was more interested in showing that this power was given to the Attorney General. Because I remember, I remember from the top of my head, when Lamin Bush, Lamin Boran Bush, and Kelefa Samba were put in the schedule of a particular decree. But the period that was relevant to the decree was a time when they were not ministers. Okay. And so I remember Mr. Wada, Mr. Mus not Wada in Perseverance Street, came to point this out and we deleted their names. I can remember that. Yes, that's but I'm not too sure whether there was any Gazette. public order as uh, published in the Gazette mm -hmm. amending the schedule of this decree. That's right. Okay. Maybe, maybe that's not conclusive. Uh, yes, yes, but my point, Mr. Mbai, is the fact that this authority was given to the Attorney General Agreed. while you were Attorney General. Yes. Well, so, the man later, I'll feel like my daughter, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman,
and technically this this means yes. that yes. if a name remains on the list mm -hmm. it is your doing as attorney general if a name is removed from the list it is your doing as attorney general so because the, now the power to control the list has been given to you as attorney general yeah. Yeah. Clarified and will come to a conclusion. That, that is that is right. But for the purposes of transparency yes. and for the purposes of the public record, so mm -hmm. that we can appreciate uh, what this means, yes. uh, we should just go through the decrees one by one and and okay. deal with them. Mm -hmm. ah, then the freezing of assets and other properties decree, and this one is for specified persons actually. This is a deliberate targeting of particular individuals. This is Decree 15 of 25th November. Uh, and, and, and Mr. Mbai, yeah. this is, you freeze the assets of people even before any judicial inquiry, mm -hmm. even before any prima facie evidence of any wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. That is terrible law. Yes. I agree. And it affected Momodu Malik Diba, Mamodu Dudu Sinyan, Babu Kargai, Ibrahim Finton Singate. These are Gambia Cooperative Authorities guys. Alaji. Mikalo Jalo, Dembo Kante, Malik Njai, Kalilu Rahman Jaite, Lamin Job, Cherno Finton Singate. Ah, yes. So, uh, this is another bad one. And, and, and the provisions are just sweeping. And then uh, let's go to the next one, Decree 16, which is the worst of the worst. Okay. That is the economic crimes decree, which was the weapon of choice for Yaya Jambe to go after every public servant he wanted to go after if you have at any stage controlled an economic resource of this country. And, and do you agree with that assessment, Mr. Mai? I agree that the decree was sweeping, yes. but economic crime is found in civilian government. Although, not defending the decree. Uh -huh. And the context will explain. Uh -huh. you, you will come to the context yes. uh, later. And I think this context is very important. We would give you ample opportunity to explain it. Yes. Uh, but you would agree that, in fact, the criminal code had sufficient provisions to deal with economic crimes issues, like economic losses for government. Mm -hmm. There were specific provisions which enable their prosecution. So it was not necessary to, to come up with this, dec this decree in order to prosecute economic crimes. Do you agree with that? In order to provide the offense of economic crime. Yes. So, so, so what this decree did is in fact to specifically highlight economic crimes by giving them a new label and a new regime for prosecution, especially on the issue of bail. It made bail basically almost very difficult for anybody who's charged with economic crimes. Do you recall that? Yes, I recall that. And even before that, even before that, we had the Special Criminal Courts Act. By which people who have been found to, who are alleged to have 
stolen public money, they are arrested and taken to a special penal court where there are severe conditions for bail. That's uh, that was the case. That became a case when Omar Job was prosecuted and convicted here and appealed to the Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal allowed his appeal and we appealed to the Privy Council. I prosecuted that case before the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, accompanied by my solicitor general at the time, Mr. Hassan Jallo. And some of the provisions were declared by the Privy Council as against due process. Exactly. Although, although, although the other provisions were safe. And that was the civilian government. That's, that's true. Uh, I but, mean, then, but then this decree made it worse. Exactly. By, by limiting due process. Exactly. But what you just cited, sir, is very important and vital experience. I think every uh, recently qualified lawyer in this country uh, is directed to that case. Yes. <laughs> the, the, because it's such a seminal case in yes. this country yes. because it, it, it deals with government excesses and government overreach, a very important case. And, and, and it's, so, it's, it's so refreshing that you prosecuted that case with the present Chief Justice, who was your then Solicitor General. But what is surprising... It's reported in the Commonwealth Law Report. Yes, that's, that's right. But what is surprising is that in spite of the lessons learned in that case, mm -hmm. what is done with this legislation, with this decree? Societies are meant to be progressive, mm -hmm. but this is a retro retrogressive step, you would agree in yes, terms of uh, protecting uh, rights of people. And having regard to my experience being the, the prosecutor before the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, the prosecutor of our, our appeal, having regard to that, that in itself explains my frustration with these decrees, and the context of them will explain. Indeed. We, we, we, would, come to, we would come to that. Uh, one other important issue here. It's... Uh, Section 4 of this decree. My fan na binyo wa section 4 ci degree bi ni. Change the ball game entirely in favor of the state. Bob mo dafa wéci mbir yépp bo xamné dafa faral ngoogi. In Gambia, the rule was you, when you can be arrested and detained for 72 for 48 hours then released. Later the APRC changed it to 72 hours. Gambia fi mu non nañu tie nit ki da way dañ la wara bayyi diiri ñaari fan way gannaaw lool nangoro EPRC ñu sopali ko def ko ñetti fan but this decree enables them to detain you for 30 days before you are taking before a court way decree bi nak ñu sopali yep nga xamne dañ la mëna tek benn place fan wéri fan bala ñu yobbu ci kanama atekay bi that is very severe isn't it lool yes. nak lu metti la that is contrary to all international norms but, but not as bad as what is found in the what do you Guantanamo Bay? The, Guantanamo Bay. In, in Cuba. Well, well, well which, which was administered by the Americans. Not as bad as the situation yeah. in Guantanamo Bay, administered by the Americans, yeah. the, the greatest democracy. That's right. But for me, Mr. Mbai, very bad and bad are yes. all bad. Yes. <laughs> the champion of human rights can be guilty of that. <laughs> that's right. As that's vast right. as the United States. Indeed. I think Indeed. I'm not defending it. Yes. I'm not defending it. And, and another provision here is where a person is convicted under this decree, he shall be liable uh, to the public, he should be liable to a fine of the amount of loss caused to the public body and shall in addition, be imprisoned. That is very draconian. Yes. Although this decree in my experience as a magistrate. Uh, the magistrate la. The early in the middle 70s to 80s. 1970, I have had occasion to convict a person and order him to pay the amount of money involved as well as go to prison. There are laws which provide that you can convict 
sentence uh, take to, to, to, order to, and fine. Uh, get him in alamant. That carry both convict no penalty of imprisonment and fine. Uh, there are even provisions where you convict and order to pay. I did that in a few times. Uh, we, we and, and legitimately in my right as a, as a, as a magistrate at the time. Yes, sir. During a very good civilian government. Yes, These are provisions in the law. Yes. Uh, I mean, Mr. Mbai, you, dealt, you did very important cases in the legal history of this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thank you for your service. Thank you. And for everything you have done to help improve uh, the justice sector in this country. Mr. Mbaye, I'm not going to you, but you have a solo your hamne. Def nga ko chibunti ate bi fi chibi reumi te loru nyong la che santa bu baha baha ba. I'm not going to you, refer your hamne def nga ko chibunta yoyu. But that said, why believe For economic losses. Chile nga hamne modi nyaka gi nyaka chwa li kom chi reumi. It's not about theft only. Ne kudne miri cha cha rekla de. It's also about actions a person may have taken or failed to take which caused the country to lose economically. Mungi ajo na shi nitki jip jinga hamne def nako wala waron nako def te defut ko nga hamne sabap na nyaka chwa li komi riyumi. This could arise as a result of a re recklessness or a result of a lapse, a result of negligence, and not deliberate theft. In such circumstances, if the government could recover what has been lost, must, must the person also go to jail? By force. It looks to me that this is very bad law. This is this is taking a cutlass to cut something that could have easily been done, could have easily been cut using a scalpel. Yeah, well, using using a hammer to kill a mosquito. Yes. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. You see. I remember as a legal practitioner, as a, as a, as a state council, a, Mo a Mauritanian shopkeeper mm -hmm. was charged with selling a tin of uh, pig milk beyond the control price. Then there was control price. Beyond the control price. Alaji M. Drame, of blessed memory, was his defense lawyer. Alaji Drame Monekon, lawyer. And I was the state counsel to prosecute him. Manamanekon lawyer in Gurgi, don't go at it. When the case was called, I rose up to be the, I rose up to be the, Drame rose up to be the appellant's lawyer. Bukave Drame, like Jokta Hawan and Momoy lawyer. To be the accused lawyer. Ne King Tuman. And I rose to be the, the state council prosecuting the Mauritanian. I remained standing. And the judge asked me whether I had something to say. I said the charge against the accused. Because he was convicted and he appealed. And there was an order that he be deported. Then they went on appeal. I remember, and the judge asked me, I said, the conviction under which this man was convicted, the charge under which the law under which he was convicted is selling a tin of pig milk above the control price. The conviction carries a fine. But not a sentence to imprisonment. But the only offense for which one could be deported is where the charge or the offense carries a conviction and a, and a fine. 
Il s'est dit que le petit pilk est le plus de contrôle de prix. Et il s'est dit que le petit pilk est le plus de contrôle de prix. Il n'y a pas de contrôle de prix où il pouvait être déporté. Il n'y a pas de contrôle de prix. Il s'est dit que le petit pilk est le plus de prix pour le pénalité d'imprisonnement et de fin. Bukan kerana luin kawaran dah lalu jiru amla, fokus ni kawaran yang ke atas bawah kami ni, dan kawaran alaman war kau teji tebel. And this is my position. Limo is mata kau. I agree. Let me finish. And the man was acquitted. New buy kena, evi ko. Alaji Dami came out and gave me his check book. He said write whatever amount you want. Cila Alaji Dami ni ojo mac check book bin nama bin dalam linga buku. I said no, I'm I'm a state council. I'm a minister of justice. Cila kau ni ko state council lah. This is the law. And I have simply stated it. Indeed. Uh, uh, that was quite honorable behavior. Uh, and that, that is the highest ethical standards expected of every lawyer. Uh, so we thank you for acting as a minister of justice uh, in that particular instant. Uh, I, I, I hope these are things uh, that uh, uh, uh, uh, budding lawyers would learn from mm -hmm. and, and, and trying to emulate. Uh, but in this particular instance, yeah, it, it looked like the legislator, in this case, the, the, council, the, council. the council. But I must, I must imagine that this must have been the advice of lawyers, because we all know the council. It was not a very sophisticated group at that time to be able to discern all these technicalities. They must have been <coughs> guided by seasoned lawyers who knew the intricacies and the mechanics of this thing to be able to structure this in such a way that the stinging effect that the executive wanted is captured in the legislation. And the, the, draftsman, <coughs> the draftsman would better explain that. Yes, but, uh, but, but I wouldn't agree. The lawyers knew. Lawyers did this deliberately. Uh, let, me, let, me remind you, let, let me remind you. Let me remind you. Let me remind you. The council came with an agenda. With a program. The legal draftsmen in, in the chambers of the attorney general. chambers of the attorney general would do anything that would show their competence in drafting. Not to allow a loophole. Not to open a door. They would, they would be proud to make a tight law that people will not escape from. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not speaking for them, but professionally, I know this is the type of thing they do. Drafting involves that. That's uh, right. No, I, although, I, although I'm not defending the that's, decree. That's right. I, I, and I agree with <coughs> all that because I am also a trained parliamentary counsel. Mm. Uh, so you are trained to write very clearly and to ensure that you, <coughs> you cover all your bases. All and, right. and but, but, but there are certain things that are based almost entirely on instruction. For instance, we all know that the international standard is you should be released within a short period of time during investigations or taken before a judge to judicially sanction your detention. That is a basic principle of law. Yes. <coughs> to decide that a person shall be detained for 30 days before the person is taken to court would not be the decision of the drafts person, that should be the decision of the decision maker, of the executive, wouldn't it? No, I would say, I would say, <clears throat> that would be the effect of the legislation. Huh. And legislations are interpreted depending on different principles. Yes. The, the, the, the, the literary rule, uh -huh. the golden rule, uh -huh. the yeah. purpose rule are developed by Lord Denning. That's right. What is the purpose of the act? Uh -huh. What were we trying to cure from the previous law? Mm. Or the literal rule, which is the bad one, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that you must interpret the legislation according to words expressed in the act. Mm -hmm. So there are different rules of interpretation. I and I would, I would venture to, <clears throat> to say that these were deliberate intentions by lawyers who were advanced and knew what they were doing. No, the purpose, 
will be subject to the interpretation by the court. That's true. And the court interpreted legislation. Mm -hmm. And what the court say would determine the law. I, not, I, not even what the legislature passed. Yes, I, I do agree entirely with that. But, but, but, but the point I am making here is in the face of the international standard, or, or what was the standard in Gambia of detention of 48 hours or 72 hours within which period you should be taken before a judge. To change that and to give the authority the power to detain a person for 30 days without taking the person to court, that must have been a decision of the executive and not the draftsman. I'm not defending it. Oh. But, I'm, but I'm explaining it in okay. the same terms uh -huh. that we are, we've agreed to use. Okay. okay. All right. So let's move on to another decree. And, and this time we go back to the freezing of assets decree. And this time, uh, certain individuals. Is it 17? Uh, 17, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Certain individuals were directly targeted. From Sarah Jangha, Abu Dentin, uh, uh, Mbam Banjik, B.I. Job, that would be Daddy Job, Sheri Yang Sise, Mumudu Gay, uh, Mumudu O Gay, Omar B. Cham, Malik I. M. Cham, Ibundur, Usain Ninjai. This is basically. The same set of people again. Yes. And this was a blanket freeze of their assets. But, but not only that, including the assets of those who were close to them, so close to them that it gave the appearance uh, that uh, they have something to do with those assets. That's how sweeping the law was. <coughs> Yes, the, this, these were terrible laws. Mr. They are terrible laws, but uh, not so much different from the, the, the Special Criminal Courts Act, the jurisdiction that was given to the Special Criminal Court Act during the civilian government. Okay, but, but it is one thing. I'm not, I'm not, uh -huh. I say, uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm not justifying it. Okay. But All I'm right. trying to point that there's a genesis to this, yes. even as far back as the civilian government. That's and right. that was the issue of our appeal before the Privy Council. That's right. Some Some of the of the the Court Act mm -hmm. okay. were okay. violations of human rights, okay. especially the bill or tracing. Mm -hmm. If, if, if, I, if, I, if I'm accused or charged under the act, and I simply pass my important vehicle to my nephew or my wife, of course, the law provided that we could trace the property That's to its destination. This was in the, and this, the same spirit, without justifying the decree, is what have found itself in it, although without naming names, because the special criminal didn't name names, mm -hmm. only provided provisions, mainly made provisions for tracing illegally gotten property, right down to its destination. Indeed. You cannot, you cannot during the period for which you are charged with an offense, mm -hmm. to automatically transfer the title of your property to somebody thinking that would save you. That's right. Uh, uh, th and that is quite reasonable, and I agree with that. Mm -hmm. The only problem I have the with schedule. this decree, uh, it's the broad nature yeah. of the decree. It's not even limited to assets that are directly traceable. Mm -hmm. Uh, to the persons listed, but anybody who is of who is close in proximity to this person mm -hmm. and has assets that may be suspected to have been linked to the person named in the schedule is also affected. Yeah. Well, so now let's look at uh, Decree 25. Decree 25. 
And this decree. The decree be more. Uh, uh, section 15A, an amended provision. Basically, ousted the jurisdiction of the court. I, I, I don't have it, but I take yeah. what you uh, Let me no, read it out. No, read it out, yes. It says limitation of jurisdiction. I agree, I, I, I, agree. <laughs> I agree. I was a victim of that decree. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but, but this decree was drafted by you. But uh, not you physically, Uncle uh, Farmer. Yes, I'm glad, I'm glad you are making the clarification. Yes. By I, didn't, the, I didn't draft any decree. Yes, by the Office of the Attorney General under your direction and supervision. By the, by the drafting division of the Attorney General's chambers. But we, we both know. Which was a department in the Attorney General's chambers when I was Attorney General and Minister of Justice. That's right. And I had the good fortune yes. to, to be recruited at the Attorney General's chambers during your tenure as minister. That's right. Yes. And, and you were very happy to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and, and, and Mr. May, uh, soon after I got trained in, in writing laws, uh, and uh, one thing I must say is that the draftsman uh, is just the taxi driver. The, the, the government, through the Attorney General, would state their destination. And even the routes they want the driver to take. As a driver, we just drive expertly. To take you to the destination safely, economically, and on time, and to avoid all difficulties and problems that may occasion us taking you to the to that destination. But unlike taxi drivers, we will take any passenger, saint or sinner. Well, Those men do not behave like taxi drivers in that regard. <laughs> That's a good one, but for us, we have, we carry only one passenger. Well, you brought the taxi driver analogy, and I'm saying taxi drivers are different from draftsmen. Taxi drivers will take any passenger, whether you are a saint or a sinner. Yes, but, but for us as draftsmen, we have only one passenger, and that is government. No, as draftsmen, draftsmen are specialists. Yes. They're especially, they, they, they, I don't agree that uh, they, they are passengers to any government. I don't agree. Uh, and they are specialists of great honor. They try to make the law understood. Uh, then you uh, say uh, uh, Mr. Mr. I, I want to read out this particular provision. Uh, uh, as a student of drafting, we studied colonial laws mm -hmm. to show how bad the colonial masters used to draft these laws mm -hmm. to continue to subjugate us. Mm -hmm. But to be quite candid, I have never seen a provision like this. Let me read it out. It says, no court shall have jurisdiction to entertain any action or proceeding whatsoever for the purpose of questioning any decision, finding, conclusion, or order, or proceeding of a commission made under this decree. This is a sweeping ouster clause. It's completely illegal. When all, all, all jurisprudence says that, well, we discussed Anis Minik yesterday, right. the beginning of all this uh, list of uh, judgment, string of judgments against ouster clauses. Mm -hmm. This is a direct affront to an Isminic principle. Yes. And it does not stop there. It went on to say, and for the avoidance of doubt, it shall not be lawful for any court to entertain any application for an order or writ in the nature of habeas corpus statute 
Sachere Rai Mandemos in prohibition, quo warranto injunction or declaration. This decree oust every form of protection an individual could have under the law of this country. To confirm that, yes. When the, we will look. When the Algali Commission, the man of the Algali Commission, be made those findings against me. Eh, been given that you in the company ni chiman. That I owe a tax liability. I had a tax of over 1.5 million dollars. Ne dal gaduna bari na maguto lusi ben million aglotek. I instituted a suit in the Supreme now High Court. Ah, chila def na ben kalame chi court bukowe bi. Justice Adio. Uh, Justice Adio was the presiding judge. Mom na mo ne kon atekat ba? Exactly relied on that provision to say that he cannot hear my case. Eh, ti fufu na gla sukande kon beta mo ne mo munta ate sumambir. His jurisdiction was posted by the decree. Eh, te wane ne dal dole jo ni mo amon gine na kon agi degree. Instructed either drama and partners. Eh, mo dal di jon digal na either drama at ni mo andal. File a notice of appeal before the Gambia Court of Appeal. This was the record of proceedings. So the High Court and the notice of appeal to the, court of, the notice of appeal to the Gambia Court of Appeal. And that was when Radio Gamba made the broadcast that all those champions of human rights who are not keeping quiet, who are not shutting their mouth, we very soon find themselves six feet deep. Moi jamano bimye ba ni si Radio Gambia ni yeye katuna mbiri yele fidob Adam buino piute. I did not pursue the appeal. But, but if I was acting for a client in that situation, I would have relied on the many decisions made by Lord Denny. You've mentioned this. And he, yeah, made by Lord Denny to succeed in that appeal. As a lawyer, any lawyer is a fool who acts for himself. But, but that is true. <laughs> but what is ironic, Mr. Mbai, is that this, this decree was written the 23rd day of December 1994 when you were Attorney General. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it was written at the Ministry of Justice under your direction and supervision with the full knowledge that this is a blatant violation of, well, would open the door for the blatant violation of rights of Gambians. And in fact, took away all the recourse that a Gambian could have for protection. Yes. Well, but if I stood as legal practitioner for a client to challenge that, that decree, I would have succeeded in having it struck out. I would have succeeded in having it struck out. Well, uh, it looked like we had a compliant judiciary, <laughs> doesn't it? Seeing that the case that you that you that you took to court was in fact uh, thrown out, yes. mainly on not not in reliance to those strings of decisions but in full application of the decree as yeah. contemplated by your office when it was written. Yes, yeah, but, but, but I knew that the judge was wrong. Why not come on a can be more of Jaruton Yon? Mr. Mbai, we have to allow for the interpretation before you I'm respond. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is it's interesting when two lawyers talk. Yes, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. Yes, that's right. But let's move on to this other decree. This is Decree 26. Mm -hmm. This is State Security 
detention of armed and police personnel. This one is also another violation of rights. Uh, these people were arrested in July 22nd. Or thereabout. They were detained at mile two for months. And now they pass a decree giving it retroactive effect to legitimize or to, to legalize their detention. But do you say to that? That was wrong. It's a matter of law. It's a matter of principle. You cannot make a retroactive provision with a penalty. Ordinarily. So that emphasizes that, that type of law was bad. And this was passed on the ninth day of February 1995. While you were attorney general. And now uh, go to the, to the last decree. Uh, this is also freezing of accounts. This again specified individuals. And this one, let's look at section two. Section two. It says the accounts of the person specified in the schedule. And any other accounts relating to them. Which are owned or operated by another person. Are hereby frozen with immediate effect. This is terrible. Uh, not only what they owned, but anything that is owned or operated by another person, which somehow had a relationship, is also frozen. This is a very good example of using a hammer to really kill a mosquito. Isn't it, Mr. Mike? Well, I won't agree using a hammer to kill a mosquito. Uh, but, but, but maybe extending the, the, the, the, the rod to another person. That's even worse. Well, that's, that's, the, way, that's, my that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. this is, this, this, these are all terrible pieces of legislation that were passed during your time as Attorney General. That were enacted by the council. That's the time that I was. Uh, it's been said, Mr. Mbai, and you'd have an opportunity to say more on this. That your second stint as Attorney General was aimed mainly to draw from experiences of 1992. Aimed at helping a government in distress. Deal with a myriad of security problems. I, I have no position on this. Uh, but I just thought it's only fair that you are given an opportunity to say something about this. Just to clarify the record. There were there was assets, uh, evaluation or something at around nineteen eighty two. Nineteen eighty two I'm on a sale of
there were security detainees and a tribunal to review their detention. Amon nani ame karange ginyo jafalen atra hawal bunti ate bo hamne danyo sed lusen bir. The same template was applied in 1994. Ben nof anam bobo nak momlen jefe chi atum 1994. Perhaps maybe that explains the desperation of the APRC junta to bring you back in 1994. Because they wanted the same machinery to be able to deal with the problems they were facing at the time. You could address that when you deal with the context and explain what happened in 82 and the similarities with okay. 94. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Can I make my statement? Uh, uh, not yet, not yet, Mr. Mike. <laughs> but uh, please allow me, at this stage, I think I should make my statement. No, uh, I just you, have you, two more points. You have finished the decrees? I, yes, I have two more points just before uh, before you do. Uh, be rest assured, Mr. Mike, uh, you would be given every opportunity. Yeah. Relating to these decrees? At Yes. They enacted at the time I was Attorney General. Yes. It's in fact not decrees as such, but some seminal events that took place during that time. But let me address the decrees first, then we come to that, please. All right. By all means. Go ahead. Yesterday, uh, we established that the decrees you referred to were introduced either before I was, Attorney I was appointed Attorney General Minister of Justice, Within a few days after my appointment. As such, I could not have played any meaningful role in the appointment of any of those people. Two, we have established the international jurisprudence on the legality of military coup d'etat. That once the takeover is successful, and provided certain, provided certain conditions are met, the new government becomes the effective government of the state. The new government then has the lawful authority to make laws for the purpose of establishing security and order, accountability and protection of human rights. Three, three. Within the office of the Attorney General Chambers, uh, was a drafting division responsible for the drafting of laws or decrees that the council considered appropriate. The attorney general would give advice where his advice was sought. Attorney general would give advice but also where his advice was not sought directly. But when matters relating to law enforcement were deliberated upon in cabinet or in council meeting. Four. My stance had always been to advise against abuses and violations of human rights. But the Attorney General, as the chief government legal advisor, takes full responsibility uh, the decrees or laws introduced while he is in office. Even if, as in my case, uh, I have strongly advised against all the decrees that I was aware of and considered to be in violation of fundamental human rights. But my advice was not always taken. Because the conviction of the AFPRC, especially in relation to accountability, was so strongly held at the time that nothing could have stopped them but divine intervention. Five. 
ignore_time_segment_in_scoring against guiding them towards an orderly transition for the restoration of a democratic government. Six. When the soldiers overthrew the former regime, one of their principal reasons was the slow pace of national development. The process was stifled by several factors, key among them rampant corruption across most sectors of the country, especially in government. A lot of people believe that their intentions for the nation were well meant and out of genuine love for the people. Seven. Naturally, the soldiers had mapped out their own way of how to address some of the fundamental issues that had affected effective and sustainable national development at the time. soldiers the decrees can perhaps be examined in the context of the trying challenges the nation had encountered or suffered before the change of government. The soldiers and the, and the people at large wanted accountability of state resources. Accountability uh, it's an element of respect for human rights. The question was how to reconcile the process of accountability with due process. This is the existential dilemma that I try to address. The dilemma was that of Jean Paul Sartre, the French philosopher, France, developed the philosophy of existentialism. Uh, the philosophy of existentialism. Yes. And he brought the case of a French soldier who was supposed to go to war. Ben a soldier in France, who was supposed to go to war. Ben a soldier in France, who was supposed to go to war. Ben a soldier in France, who was supposed to go to war. Ben a soldier in France, who was supposed to go to war. Ben a soldier in France, who was supposed to go to war. Ben a soldier in France, who was supposed to go to war. Going to war as a duty to my country and attending to my sick mother. That's the dilemma I was in. In the context of the Gambia. Gambia. Africa in particular. Africa in the world at large. There can be legal jurisprudence that corruption can be an abuse and violation of human rights. It may violate the same, the following principles. A. Equality and non-discrimination. B. Right to economic development. C. Right to food. D. Right to adequate housing. E. 
ignore_time_segment_in_scoring Going through the decrees one after the other. Would they not assist? Giving that I have already stated clearly. Uh, that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the decree that the that I was Attorney General Minister of Justice. Ti jamono bi nga xamé ni yépp né dal ma nek ministre bi Seytou Wali Loua ak atté ci réew mi. Now. In this regard. Eh ci kaw li nak. Do you feel fair it otherwise I was going to admit that it's not within the mandate of this commission. But you've allowed me to use that. Yes sir. In this regard. Eh ci kaw lolu. In my reflections with Admiros. Ah ci li nga xamné ni lolu moy li fegn ci awma nak Seytou. I want to refer to Justice Hassan Jalla's memoir. Madam, na kisir na linga kamne ni mungi jam chwale Hassan Jallo. Journey for Justice. Moi Journey for Justice di yon wa kamne yonge ut de grek. At pages 121. Ah, tifu timer ak nyar fukak ben. 122. Nyar fukak nyar. And ben 71. Ak jurom nyar fukak ben. Where he points out. For kamne wale nani. 121. If nyar fukak ben. Enter Fafambay as the new Attorney General and Minister of Justice. Duganak de Fafambay, the new Minister of S. Bin Seytou Ali Loua, at the Chiriou Mi. Armed with multiple degrees in political science and in law. Nga khamne ni nak amna kham kham mu yadu chi wali digi ak political science ak wali Loua. A well-read man. Di ni kwa khamne ni ku jangala. With still a voracious appetite for board reading. Nga khamne ni amna ina nak pur jangal lubari. His arrival generated a lot of excitement. It was my first incarnation as Minister of Justice. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Through a system of asset declaration and evaluation. The law has been enacted and given a viral and look at how the government grew. I can tell you that this is a joke. His first idea was that the chambers needed a better working environment than provided at the old stone and lime structure at the quadrangle in Banjul, supported by wooden floorboards constructed during the colonial period. Uncle Fafat, la fatol kabugu. Let me read it again. Yes, please. Papa <laughs> came with fresh ideas. Uh, uh, okay, the interpreter has got to know. Uh, he had ideas of law reform. He had ideas of fostering greater integrity in government. Through a system of asset declaration and evaluation. His course idea was that the chambers needed a better working environment. He had ideas of 
than that provided by the old stone and lime structure at the quadrangle in Banjo. Supported by wooden floss boards constructed during the colonial period. We packed our office baggage to private premises at Bokul Street. Only to find those flats built for residents, equally unsuitable. Off we went with our baggage and finally settled at the Marina Parade. Taking over the new but the new but not fully occupied headquarters of the Social Security and Housing Finance Corporation. <coughs> Security Housing Finance Corporation for Falling Dalon. The premises were ideal. Being one of the few places purpose built for office accommodation. Father was to eventually pilot through Parliament the Law Reform Commission Act 1983. To establish a commission to systematically review and revise the laws. And the law and the Gambia Law Foundation Act 1983. As a medium where private individuals and corporations could contribute materially and financially to the improvement of the machinery of justice. So, so this is also the evaluation of assets and properties and the prevention of corrupt practices act. And asset declaration bill which would have made it mandatory for all public officers upon appointment and thereafter at regular specific intervals to declare their assets and liabilities on oath. And at page Half and by his tenure of office as Attorney General and Minister of Justice was brief but turbulent. Pointed in early 1982. Following the presidential and parliamentary elections, two years later, by June 1984, he had resigned from the office. A significant part of the turbulence of his tenure was associated with the establishment and operation of the Commission for the Evaluation of Assets and Properties and the Prevention of Corrupt Practices. An institution seen largely but erroneously as the creation of FAFA. Rather than of the government as a whole. Through, it was he who, as Attorney General, introduced the proposal to the cabinet and was seen as its champion. But, why? It was a collective cabinet response that gave birth to it. The decrease should be looked at in the same light. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Mbai. That is uh, uh, very important material you have. In his memoir, now yes. Chief Justice of the Gambia. But he knew me. He was my solicitor general. He did a lot of good work for this country. Indeed. Thank you. I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, dispute that fact. Uh, and I agree completely.
and uh, we all hold all of you to very high regard. Uh, you mentioned the issue of cabinet responsibility. Uh, and in that regard, uh, in your case, you have had the three, three bites at the cherry when it comes to these decrees. Uh, <laughs> Which means, um, in your capacity as Attorney General overseeing the drafting uh, of these laws, I wouldn't say overseeing. I had intermediaries between me and the draft individual, the Solicitor General, I had the Registrar. But ultimate responsibility. The Solicitor General does not go to cabinet. It's the Attorney General who's the interface uh, between the drafting department and, and cabinet. And those who write the laws do not write these laws without instructions. They receive drafting instructions. And, and those things come from the Attorney General. True? Yes, ultimately. Yes. So, so, so the Attorney General, Attorney General has, has responsibility for of what comes out of the Ministry of Justice. You agree? I agree. So I the Attorney General, General there, because the Parliamentary Council does not draft laws in his name. I think I have settled that. Yes. It was a division in my chambers. Yes. But as Attorney and Chief, Government legal advisor. Yes, I take responsibility. Thank you very much. And uh, and also, but but I take responsibility. But was not the one who enact, enacted the laws decree were enacted by the council. That's true. But I'm coming. And sometimes to they took my advice. Sometimes they rejected my advice. That's right. Yeah. But uh, the the next step is at cabinet level too. You have responsibility, cabinet collective responsibility uh -huh. for these decrees. Correct. Yes, because they were considered by cabinet before they went to the council. And also at the third level, which is the it, ultimate level, at council level, you also share responsibility for these decrees? No, no, not share responsibility. I was advisor. I was advisor. Not necessarily my advice was taken. I have said it in my statement. But, but Mr. Mbai, if you sit with a body like council mm -hmm. and you give advice, and they reject the advice, and you, the decision is taken, and you don't resign, it means you have also acquiesced or adopted or accepted the decision. No, if I sit in a court of appeal, a member of a panel of three, and two of them give a majority decision. And I give a dissenting decision. I don't resign because I disagree with the majority. Secondly, I've explained my dilemma. Whether to continue my efforts against abuses of human rights or leave to make a bad situation getting worse. I was halfway across the desert. The dilemma was either to go on or to retreat. That was my position. But even in that situation, uh, the, these bad laws, 
were not just bad in the books. They were terrible or even worse in their application. And we all saw what was happening. As people were being unceremoniously taken from their homes, their properties being taken, some being unfairly or unlawfully detained without any judicial process or that was the order of the day. And I refer to the very first few weeks where senior government officials were put in trucks and being driven all around town to humiliate them. I, I think I have in my statement mm -hmm. explained mm -hmm. the circumstances mm -hmm. and my situation as Attorney General. Yeah, and that, and that that extent, the one in mm -hmm. I accept responsibility, not that I agreed with them, okay. but that I didn't advise. Okay. And I think, uh, I think the repetition of it, mm -hmm. which we have gone through already, okay. oh, uh, may, uh, may, may sound a bit prejudicial. Oh, oh, oh. You've said it already. If, if and I've explained my position okay. if, if and the circumstances is, at the time. If that is the way you feel about it, my sincere apologies. That Thank was you. not the intention no, I know. Uh, at all. I know. Uh, but uh, the, the point has been made. All right. Uh, and I've explained. All right. Thank I you very much. I'll you. now move on to some other point. <clears throat> November 11. November. <clears throat> November. On Remembrance Day. This country witnessed the worst bloodbath in its history. When members of the council went to the two military barracks of Yundum and Fajara and summarily executed soldiers who were accused of planning or being involved in a coup d'etat with impunity. It was bad, the bad. worst thing that happened to this country. The evidence given in this commission, uh, all those who testified here in that regard, not any one of them mentioned my name. Oh. Oh, certainly, certainly uh, there is no suggestion yeah. or allegation that you are part of it. Right. Yes. Yeah, just to make it clear because the public is listening. Yes. And I would tell you that I was as devastated as anybody at that time, <laughs> even without knowing what had happened. The events of November 11. 11. The details and the and the ugliness of it, the, horri ho the horrible ugliness of it, was not known to many Gambians. The vast majority of Gambians, until the provisions of this, the the the sittings of this commission started. I remember having to vacate my premises at 45 Caraba Avenue. Uh, enjoy, my former teacher came for me and took me to his house. Only the watchman and the security were there. And the American embassy offered me protection. Uh, American embassy, you must have heard it, you played it on record when Yajame was asked. The American ambassador contacted Mr. Mbai that the situation was under control. Yeah. That came in the in the recording of, of which you played on the on the on. The. So I was just as any other Gambian. My Gambian, maybe more more than any Gambian, 
The feeling of insecurity of my own being at that time. That is why Enjai came for me. The American Embassy offered me protection. Because they thought I would be vulnerable, one of yeah. the most vulnerable citizens in this country. Having regard, having regard to the EU ambassador's letter to me, uh, letter to me EU and he was shocked by the lack of public recognition of the efforts I have made for the sake of this country. We will come to that. And perhaps maybe that would be a fitting point to conclude your testimony. Uh, so I have a lot to do. I have a lot yes, to do. I, mean, I mean that point uh, okay. should be uh, yeah. perhaps uh, the conclusion of your testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, let's deal with the other issues and then we, until we get to that point. Was November 11 discussed at the council? No. Very November 11. What time in the council? Let, let me explain something. There were David. times when we had council meetings. Council meetings. I'm not time when I'm on your time. Council meeting. And the military members of the council. And you have many soldiers in the country council. Bo. Would be in the office of the chairman. You know, like in the office of the chairman be. For hours. I walk to. While the secretary general and I were waiting in the cabinet room. Same thing would happen in cabinet meetings. I remember Mrs. Satangjau. Who turned to me and said, Chamenu Jambur. They've been sitting here for so long, they are, they are chatting. And when we left here, we have a lot of things to do. Uh, and I said, to talk to the Secretary General. The Secretary would say, And the Secretary General will always say that they, are, they have already known that we are here. There was one day when I walked out to the Chairman's office. And held the branch of a tree which was protruding into his window. That military officers are used to respect time. And the military officers don't respect time. We've been in the cabinet room for more than one hour. You get the cabinet when you are meeting with them to do a bend over. I feel like tagging this branch and give you a good beeping. Because one of them, Edward Singate, used to tell me that he was in the same class with my son Omar. And I took them as as as my children. And they all used to call me Uncle Human Rights. Uncle yeah, Human yeah, Rights. Yeah, any, right. any member of the cabinet at that time yeah. would accept and confirm that I was Uncle Human Rights in cabinet and in, in the council. There was a time when the a delegation from Ghana came. And we went to see them at the airport. And somebody said, Uncle Human Rights. Uncle Human Rights. The leader of the delegation, Kwame Ahoy. The leader of the Ghanaian delegation, Kwame Ahoy. Kwame Ahoy, GT1 group. Told me this is the greatest compliment to an attorney general. I called the minister to be called the human rights attorney general in the military government. It's the greatest compliment. And a Gambian called Didi Jaite. Estate agent. One day when he returned from Ghana, he saw a post at the airport. I don't want to appear self-serving. This is what he told me. He put my poster, my picture on a, on a pillar. And said very good things about the efforts I was doing here, even when Gambians were not recognized. But I am satisfied with my conscience well, that I have tried to do a great deal for my conscience. Thank you. But in spite of all that, you lost your job. You 
lost your properties for almost a decade. Mm. And in 1996, you went to your hometown in Farafeni. You went to Farafeni. Farafeni. Yes. And you were arrested. Can you tell us about it? Yes. yes, in spite of all that, I go every day. I lost my job. I lost my property for a decade. And at the appropriate time, I'll be applying to this commission. To consider me for repatriation. The losses I suffered. Wrongly and unlawfully. Uh, but when you come to that, I make the necessary application. So tell us about the events in Farafeni. Yes. You know, I enjoyed writing this. Yes. And sometimes I feel better when I read it. Yeah. Somebody, even when you talk, when you say <laughs> things off the cuff, it looks like you're reading it. I've been following. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is memorized from writing it. No, if I, if I was your age, I'd throw it away and say it orally. Even, even if I was your age, I would have said all these things orally but without e looking at any document. But even yesterday, you but weren't I'm looking at it, but you, <laughs> I'm not growing old you still memorized it. Thank Please you. go ahead, read from it if you... If In you November 1995, in November 1995, my mother's younger sister, Rakesh Mayai, who must have been in her late 70s and early 80s, sent her grandson to me to go and see her in the village. She was going blind and wanted to see me before she did. My cousin Maman Bai and I left Banjul on Saturday morning 27th January 1996 by GPTC boss. Mm -hmm. Before at the time my motor car has already been taken from me. A visitor in Bayan village. Bayan. Bayan. Also to visit a sick uncle in Giant Sanjal. A few miles east of Farafenya. By the time we arrived in Bayan village, by the time we arrived there, my aunt was already blind. We returned to Farafenya the next day, Saturday, 28 January 1996 and proceeded to the Bamba Tenda ferry terminal where we bought our tickets ready to cross over to Yili Tenda from where we would return to Soma to catch the GPTC bus back to Banjo. While we were waiting to board the ferry, two police officers, one in uniform and the other in plain clothes, Arrested me. We all returned to Farafenya police, police Station. In the same vehicle which had earlier taken us to the ferry terminal. At the station we met ASP Keba Jones. police station Who told us that he had received orders from Banjul since the week before. To arrest me wherever I was seen. I asked him why and what it was all about. But he said that he did not know. He also told us that he was to escort us to Banjul. But that as he had no fuel in his vehicle, we would have to spend the night at the police station. Until the next day, Monday, 29 January 1996. We are never told the reason for our arrest. It was during Ramadan. And I'm proud to share. The police station became a feast. 
food ndogo came from everywhere uh, everything lip dal ndogo yep ñowé jogé ko fune ak sifa from hadi sheka ni khali sheka from aida sala aida sala from the compound of chief keba jamé ci kéri keba jamé from dr nyangado khalidou nyangado ci dr khalidou nyangado who was my senior at amity mom nak suma kuma jitu won la ci amity next morning ci lek ci suba esp keba jones told us that instead of he esp keba jones wa ne bu mom sax inspector kutubo kutubo subare subare sabure sabure inspector kutubo sabure would be our escort mom mo ñu yobu but that we have to meet the inspector's fare to banjul we have to pay his we arrived at banjul police headquarters about two o'clock in the afternoon and we are received by cmc jawara ñu aksi nak ci banjul police headquarters bi ñaari waxtu ci becc ki ñu fa teew na moy cmc jawara after receiving the inspector's report and a statement from me ganna bu ñu jotee nak statement bi report bi ak ci man including the return ferry ticket we had bought the day before ak ñaari ferry ticket yi ñëndon bala bes bobu cmc jawara after a few consultations on the telephone ganna bu mu diso tuti na ci telephone bi release us mu baye ñu the next day there was an observer newspaper front page headline ci elex nak ci kayti xibaar bu ñu xamé observer ci kay bu ñëk bi the former attorney general again ne ki nekkon attorney general bi wat did fafam bay attempt to abscond fafam bay dafa paré won pour daw in my reaction ci suma cadeau nak pour tontu lolu adding insult to injury gëna yok nak metit ci gañu gañu which was a weekend observer february 2 to 4 99 front line headline fafam bay reacts ci weekend bi nak ñu bind fafam bay reacts moy tontu na fafam bay reacts moy fafam bay day tontu na i concluded as follows ni la wax nak if i wanted to leave this country ne bu ma fekkon ne dama bëggona genn rew mi i would not have waited all this long duma doon taar waxtu wi yeb o choosing to do it all the way from farafeñ wala sax xelatu ma dara lu moy bu defé ko jeb fi be farafeñ in any case ci lu muñti xew nak at my age now ak suma at fim tollu i am too old and therefore too late da da maget na legi te tardi na trop pi tamen to leave this country for any reason pour genn ni ci rew mi ci ben dalil i also think that after my three little children of 8 10 and 13 ah ak suma ñetti xalé yi ño xamné ni ñu ngi fi and i ak man ci suma bopu have been summarily evicted from our own house eh nga xamné ni genné nañ ma ci suma nek in 1996 ci atum 1996 the only house i have and ever had ben keer bi nga xamné mo rela am and in fact spend the last 90 to 20 years building nga xamné ni ci ñaar fukki at tabax and my car and all my household furniture seized from us ak suma nege suma auto be ak suma bagage nege yeb ñu nangu ko we should be left alone e war nañ ñoy genn nak war nañ ñoy baye legi war nañ ñoy baye legi excuse me just want to Sorry. Proceed please. Hmm. Sorry, sorry. Captain, I I'm looking for a better copy of this. some missing pages. It's caught at the end. Mm, sorry about that. 
I concluded as follows. I want to repeat this. If I had wanted to leave this country, I would not have waited all this long choosing to do it all the way from Farafenya. In any case, at my age now, I am too old. I have too late to leave this country for any reason. I also think that after my three little children of 8, 10, and 13 years old, respectively, and, and I have been summarily evicted from my own house on 11 January 1996. The only house I have and ever had. And in fact, spent the last 19 to 20 years building. And my car and all my household furniture seized from us. We should be left alone. To paraphrase Kipling, Rudyard Kipling. I had to proceed. In a little book which in the service of my beliefs, yeah. I preface the book with Kipling's poem, If. If. I said, the paragraph claim, then I quote, to keep our heads when all about us are losing theirs and blame it on us. Or being lied about, refuse to deal in lies. Or being hated, refuse to give way to hating. And hold him on when there is nothing except the will which says to us, hold on. The great prophet Muhammad had his Abu Jahl, but he also has his Abu Bakr, Omar, Usman, and Ali. Jesus Christ had his Parishis and Sadducees, but he also had his Peter and John. Moses had his Pharaoh, but he also had his Aaron. Julius Caesar had his Brutus, Cassius, and Casca. But he also has his Atomidorus and Mark Antony. Stalin had his Trotsky, Bukharin, and Bayra. But he also has his Verestuchov and Molotov. It is with this sense of history and an illimitable faith in Allah that my spirit remains incrushable. Sometime in 2006, the Inspector General of Police at the time, this, this is published in the newspapers, and I have them. Yes, please. Yeah. You, you can provide them later. Yeah. Sometime in 2006, the Inspector General of Police, at the time, popularly called Tatin Badi. Bless his Tatum memory, he uh, died a few days ago. Uh, Tatin Badi. Visited me in my chambers. In chambers. And suggested that I write to the President and ask for the return of my property at 45 Caravan Avenue. The Attorney General and Minister of Justice at the time, Sertijan Haidara. Also made the same suggestion. The Secretary General Mr. Ali Ngom. The Secretary General Mr. Ali Ngom. Was also of the same view. I hesitated to do so. But an old good friend and well-wisher, Pate Bajaha, came to my chambers and strongly urged me to do so. Eventually, I wrote, and by letter delivered to me by Mama Kinta Jawara, at the State House, the state house my property was returned to me. Uh, I have been trying to, to see this letter, the letter I wrote and the, and the, the reply. Because when I wrote, because they urged me to do so, that he was, he was ready now to, to give me my property. Um, who was he? Who was he? The, the, the president. The president beyond. And let me just write. They tried to urge me, just write to get back your property. And I wrote. I have not been able to find this letter and the reply. But I remember saying that I'm, I'm writing to you to ask you to invoke your constitutional prerogatives to return me my property, where I can return to with my family, etc., etc. I said, I know that I've been trapped in a lie so perfect that the truth did not save me. Mangom Sise picked that quotation and was one day telling me, trapped in a lie so perfect that the truth could not save me. 
And that was what I used in my letter. And I got a reply immediately. Mama Kinsa Jawara, then at the State House, called me. Uncle Fafa, I have a good letter for you. Yeah. Can you come and take it? I said, how can I come with the security? He said, we'll arrange that. They'll, they'll allow you to come in. I walked it. I didn't drive. I walked it from Hill Street to the State House. The Madoksa, the Guma Otore, the Godage embed Hill Street, the State House, Epsi Banjul. They were expecting to allow me. When I reached Mama Kinsa's office, as she gave me the letter, the telephone rang, and she was wanted, maybe by the president. The president the president. He delivered the letter to him, and I walked back to my chambers. I refused to open it. When I reached Fanafana Chambers in Hill Street, I stood by the window for a long time, looking for any NIA officers coming around. Eventually, I went home. I will not read the letter until I have my lunch. Because if I read it, I may not have my lunch. At five o'clock, I will not read it after five o'clock. I see five, do my jungle again now five. Eight o'clock, I will not read it. I will read it before going to bed. But if I did, I may not be able to sleep. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? I took my card, took ablution, and opened the letter. The president gave him orders president that my property be returned to me. Together with all that have been seized from me. I put it under my praying mat. Slept on it. Thinking that I'll have nightmares. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mbai. Perhaps this is a convenient time to stop for the first break, and then you would proceed with your testimony when we return. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council, when we come back, if you can, uh, from your compendium of uh, decrees, just give us the number of decrees some of that were uh, drafted when uh, witness was uh, attorney general, and also perhaps some tell us which um, uh, decrees are still in force. Okay. When we come back, so we will um, resume at uh, 12:45. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.